Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to part two of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies presentation. So where we had last left off, um, Napoleon, I think we had covered Napoleon falling and the two separate kingdoms of the Kingdom of Naples and the Kingdom of Sicily, being the island Sicily, were parted and the bringing together of them back after the fall of Napoleon. Okay, so to pick up where we were, in 1814 was the Congress of Vienna, pictured here, and it was really to kind of resize the main powers to balance them out and through this create a long-term peace across Europe. And it, it's kind of been heralded as, heralded I should say rather, as a you know, a, a fair kind of kind of treaty to really restore former lands to the former respective powers and, you know, etc., things like that. In reality, you got more so it was used to not particularly be fair. I'm not saying it wasn't fair, but, you know, things were seeded maybe when they shouldn't have been simply for the to really instill a balance, um, you know, I don't know. I don't really know how to say it. That's a whole. That's a story for another another day. Um, but at the end of the day, it ended up falling that you know the Spanish Bourbons were, you know, given back the island of Sicily. And at first, as I had previously discussed in. Part one, um, Napoleon's brother-in-law was originally allowed to keep his throne, but after kind of backstabbing the Austrians and realigning himself with Napoleon and starting a Neapolitan war that really only lasted a week, and also aligning with Napoleon for the Hundred Day War after he came back from Elba, you know, that was voided. He was executed. And thus, at the Congress of Vienna, it was given back to the Bourbons, and so what you had then was, excuse me a moment as I search through my uh, my notes here. So what you had here was Ferdinand pretty much repealed all the reforms and, you know, he actually removed the Kingdom of Sicily, which, as I had previously discussed, was, that was always the united of Naples, the, what we now call the Kingdom of Naples and the island of Sicily. They were always originally known as the Kingdom of Sicily as a collective, okay? The Kingdom of Naples is more or less what we use now simply to discern between the two of Kingdom of Sicily and Kingdom of Naples. Originally, they were all just, you know, you'll hear it sometimes as the old kingdom, right? The original kingdom, because that's what it always was since Roger II, as I discussed in part one, you know, as a united entity, you know, property. And, and by that, I mean actually join together formally and officially, okay? Because there were various other times throughout their respective histories where they were possessed by the same powers. But, you know, as we see that in this, in the, in this time period, that meant nothing. I mean, lands were, you know, checkers, chess pieces, what have you, you know? So it was easy to possess a f three or four at the same time, and that didn't necessarily mean they were you know, joined up, because then you'll hold on to this one and trade the other one for, to this guy for something else, you know, anyway, I went more than that in the part one, I encourage you to watch part one if you haven't already, but, um, so yeah, Ferdinand the first comes back, and he pretty much just removes everything else that was done, um, you know, and, and he wipes the kingdom of Sicily from the map, and now it's replaced by the two Sicilies, uh, being referred to as you know, both Sicilies is, is really the the more proper translation is both Sicilies, meaning the original kingdom of Sicily, which, you know, be termed Naples, and then also the island of Sicily. And the people of Sicily really didn't care for this. And it's kind of, you know, they had rebellions in 1820 and 1848, which, you know, people have attributed to different things. Um, one of them being that classic kind of Sicilian ego of not being ruled or that, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, in reality, I would say it was from, they still wanted to have, 
they wanted to be a sovereign state, more or less. You know, when you look at, like, Parma, the Duchy of Parma, you look at uh, Veneto, you know, Venice, they really wanted something along those lines, okay? And, uh, you know, and they know that from hundreds of years earlier, through Roger II and the Normans, they had these good things. And then even up through the, you know, Charles the Third, you know, son of Philip, they really had great things. I mean, they that, that's that's you know one of one of the bad the bad misunderstandings nowadays is that we think that Sicily was always just overruled and oppressed, which did happen, but it was you know it wasn't constant. It was not the constant, and they were aware of these good times. You know, it's it's not like they were just being oppressed nonstop and didn't know anything else. They knew other things. That's why you get these const you know these these periodical rebellions and revolts and so you know when you have ferdinand come back into power in 1815 1816 and just immediately repeal you know these these constitutions that they had had you know which they can never just hold on to i mean you know back when um ferdinand was a, a baby and he wasn't really or not a baby a child and he wasn't really in in charge of the government even though he was the acting head you know you had Great Britain had a base on Sicily, and through uh, Lord Bentinck, who was, I mean, he, he really helped advance them along to a, you know, uh, a very modern two-house parliamentary system and a constitution, and, you know, as soon as Napoleon's de deposed, they get given, gifted back, really, by the Congress of Vienna to the Spanish Bourbons, which I don't think was a problem in and of itself, but to repeal all of you know, all, all of the progresses that they've made really was the, deter the deterring factor. And that really caused these revolts and rebellions, which at the end of the day, you know, kind of opened the door for the, f really led to their own demise, you know, quite frankly, the Spanish bourbons. And so then you had Fer Ferdinand II, who was there from 1830 to 1859. He was really popular early on. Um, but he had a couple of, a couple of revolutions. And that, that, like I said, I mean, just, just repealing those, you know, those constitutional and democratic, um, you know, policies by Ferdinand I really lingered on for a long, long time. I mean, so in, in 1848 was, you know, was really like the key, a key date in the history of this kingdom as that was, you know, simply a huge rebellion where they were, you know, really quite thorough and demanding their their sovereignty and their their rights and and things of this nature, and this was not unique to Italy either. I mean, you can look it up. There were liberal revolutions throughout Europe in 1848, but you know, it, it's well argued that they really began here. You know, in the south of Italy and Sicily. You know, as I'd previously said, as a direct result of the prior advances being repealed by Ferdinand I. And so you have Ferdinand II, okay, and so he dies in 1859, early death, and, you know, the main, the main story there is that it was from an assassination attempt that was botched, but then he died later from, I think, the poison or infection, something, something of this nature, something went, just quite frankly, went wrong after the botched assassination attempt. I'm not sure how factual this story is. But either way, he, he he really died quite early, quite young, you know, in 1859. And, you know, from here, it just never really, it just, it just never really gets that much better for them, honestly. So that really kind of opens things up for, you know, the what's what's set to come soon. And, um, you know, before we, before we get any further, I would like to show just this, this quick note. So here, you know, you see there's the economic situation before 1861, unification of Italy, and the Kingdom of Sicily was, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, rather, beg your pardon, was absolutely the most most advanced, most wealthiest, I mean, you know, st state, Italian state, bar none. Um, and, and so from this point on, you know, we're, we're going to kind of get to these diverging theories, okay? And by diverging theories, what I, of course, mean there is that you know, so you have the first theory, which has been more or less widespread, and the more mainstream one being that, you know, the Bourbons were oppressive and just, you know, re really took advantage of, of the people and just made bad situations worse, and that, you know, the, the coming reunification and the Garibaldi really helped 
liberate them, right? And then the second theory, which has really been gaining more traction amongst the, you know, historical uh, circles and and the more more intellectual circles, I guess you could say, is that, you know, this was all more or less a coup by the other powers to really isolate and get rid of the Spanish Bourbons to really reap the benefits of of the kingdom of the two Sicilies, quite frankly you know this is really them just playing playing the utmost you know political you know powers that that they could like just playing the game more or less okay and so i am going to touch on these and i want it just to be known because it's it's one of those things where you feel like neither side is really right or wrong it's it and by that I mean theory. Neither theory is really fully right or fully wrong. And and more or less in history you get it to where it's kind of, you know, maybe a mixture of the two. Okay, but some things are simply fact that you cannot overlook. And, and one of them is being how, you know, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies was, you know, the wealthiest, you know, state the wealthiest Italian state pre-unification, and, that, and that's quite simply a fact. Um, they had half the national debt of places like Parma and Piedmont, which were, you know, as, as we look nowadays, are like the wealthy northern Italian areas, you know. And also they had their own money that was backed almost completely by gold and silver. Okay, so I mean, which was a big deal. I mean, they had they had very low debt, astronomically low debt. Um, you know, and, and so all the very low taxes, actually, as, as I've covered in part one through the different monarchs that they have had under the Bourbons. OK, so, you know, and it's easy to argue that, you know, yeah, Bourbon in the house was still a ruling power and, and it was still like imperialism and, and things of that nature. But on the ground, it, it you know, it's it's not such a clear picture. You know, because nowadays we look back on all of these times and we think like, oh, if you're being ruled by somebody else, then it's automatically bad. But, you know, what you have to understand at this point is that almost no state, region, whatever is really ruled by just like the native people, the the people who live there. OK, I mean, it just wasn't it just wasn't common. It wasn't, very, you know, really that common. I mean, you have. Like I said, I mean, they're just pieces are changing hands. There's intermarriages. I mean, it's just all just a, a game. It's all just a power struggle. You know, it's quite fascinating for us now. But at the times, it was normal to have, you know, the powers that be in your land being royalty from another. That's just the way it was. Okay, and as I said, there are the two conflicting theories now. You know, and I like people to make up their own minds. But I'm simply trying to state the facts now that economically. Things were not that bad off in Sicily. Um, you know, and I'll get more into the other developments that they have had had, you know, throughout throughout their kingdom and, and how things just went downhill afterwards. Um, you know, and here's a sulfur mine, which this really goes into a big factor of, as I said, I mean, just economically, not only economically, but industrially, okay? I mean, sulfur was a huge thing on the island of Sicily. And, you know, this... An aspect of one of the theories is that Great Britain helped the Savoys and the Piedmontese, who in turn hired Garibaldi more or less, with the promise of sulfur for all their wars, because then they would more or less have an unlimited supply of bullets, quite frankly. Um, and again, that's just a part of the theory. I'm not giving credence to that or anything, but you know, this is just kind of a testament to that. It wasn't all just royalties and gold and silver. I mean, it was... You know, industrially, they were, they were, you know, they were reaping their resources. They were really taking advantage of the land. And I don't mean that in like a non-environmental way. I just mean that realistically, they were taking advantage of what they had, you know, their resources there. Um, you really didn't have a sense of like in Africa where it's, you know, huge, re you know, environmental resource wealth that nobody's taking advantage of. I mean, in, in Sicily, the kingdoms, I mean, they, they were reaping benefits from these, okay? And so, you know, here here we have, you know, so we're going to touch base on the Savoys a bit here. So, 1720, they traded Sicily for Sardinia. And, you know, as you know, Sardinia is an island in, in the Mediterranean there. 
you know, kind of south of France, uh, west of the boot of Italy. And so now you had the Duchy of Savoy become the Kingdom of Sardinia, okay? And so the Savoy House, which originally from that kind of, that kind of three land area, Dry Landerac, I think is how they how they term it in, in German, but it's more or less north northwestern Italy there near Switzerland and France, um, in the Alpine area. And so the Savoys had begun, you know, years ago by managing these mountain passes, you know, and through that comes taxes, comes you know, more power of managing these trade routes and, you know, and, and things like that. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to get too much into all their, all their background, but eventually they, they come into power with Sicily. And I think they, they won it through a treaty for another war years ago and they traded it for Sardinia and which really isn't a, isn't a terrible, a terrible trade. I don't believe, um, you know, Sardinia is much more manageable and it's much closer to your, you know, the lands that you already possess. So through this, you know, the Duchy of Sa the formerly known Duchy of Savoy in the, in the northwest of, front of Italy, and then the island of Sardinia now, you have these two united, and now you have the Kingdom of Sardinia, okay? And this was in 1720, okay? Maybe 100 years before, 100 or so years, 150 years, rather, um, you know, before the reunification of... of should I say unification of Italy. And so now the Duchy of Savoy is a kingdom of Sardinia. Okay. So by letting Sicily go, they became a kingdom. So now they have more power. They have more lands and they're really starting to expand and brush shoulders. Cause not only now are you your own kingdom. Now you're recognized as royalty. Now you're intermarrying with royalty. Okay. This really opens up your house to more or less limitless possibilities, quite frankly. Okay. And, and the thing about the Savoys was they, they just played the game the best way you almost could okay they were they were never major players in wars really they were never um this this huge kind of everybody's watching you kind of house um they weren't they weren't the Habsburgs. they weren't they weren't the bourbons i mean this 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 was never really their 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 forte you know they were much more curtain you know curtain closed um you know, rubbing shoulders, you know what I mean, kind of, kind of people, and th they expanded through political maneuvers and alliances, that was their forte, you know, and how, how, you know, between the Austrian Habsburgs, they would say early on that, you know, their territory grew with marriages, with, with the Savoys, it was more so just being really politically smart, forming alliances, you know, left and right, um, they, they just really played the game in every sense of the word, okay, and so, you know, moving forward, you know, you have Garibaldi here, and I just want to make something clear. He was a soldier of fortune, okay? I'm not, that doesn't mean that he didn't have emotional attachments to reuniting Italy. I'm sorry, uniting Italy. I'm not saying that he was in it just for wealth or power or anything like this. That's, that's not my prerogative. But again, I feel like it's, it's too naive to simply believe that he was only some guy who was like a hero of of Italy, you know, Italy sweetheart that re, you know just unites the entire the entire lands. Um, that just wasn't the case. Okay, he he was involved in the Brazilian ragamuffin war. He was involved in the Uruguayan civil war. He was involved in the Austro Sardinian war. He was involved in the Franco Prussian war. I mean, he was involved in plenty of wars that didn't actually have anything to do with him quite frankly and again i don't say that in a in a in a slight way but i just think that that's something that people should understand when you know when i'm trying to convey when i'm telling this story is that it wasn't just you know again it, it wasn't just poor southern italy poor sicily and here comes your savior to really bring you you know ahead that just wasn't the way it was okay and so as I just said, he's in the Austro-Sardinian War, which, Kingdom of Sardinia, that's the House of Savoys, okay? So, you know, the Savoys, more or less, after, after Ferdinand II died unexpectedly, and, and things were very unstable, and there were already revolts and rebellions going on, they pretty much reached out to Garibaldi, and it was, hey, you know, you're, you're our guy, you're going to be our guy, right? That's, that, that's what happened, okay? And again, I'm not really trying to be involved in any either one of these um you know either either 
theory based on if it was just like an actual liberation or if it was this whole conspiracy thing but this is pretty much a proven fact i mean he he was picked by the the savoys the kingdom of sardinia to kind of lead the invasion of of the kingdom of the two sicilies and they had already used his services before quite frankly austro sardinian war so you know here was a, a a trusted proven soldier of fortune who had a big name He's a powerful man, and I believe, I think he believed in the cause, I really do, but at the end of the day, you know, from the outside looking in, this is the way it was, okay, so, you know, from, from this, you just had, you had, that's more or less it, so he, you know, showed up with his, his, his thousand men on Sicily, and, you know, the rest is pretty much history, toppled the kingdom, and in this time period, you had... Garibaldi, he aligned with southern crime organizations and mafiosi, you know, to gain the local local sway and control. And as a result, the status and power of uh, of, of these criminal organizations escalated. And to this day, I mean, they're, they're you know, they're still a thing. You know, I mean, you know, Sic- Sicily's number one famous export is, is, is probably this, you know, the mafia, the criminal. I mean, we've all seen The Godfather, we've all seen Goodfellas, and that all stems from this, which really... You know Garibaldi's invasion really helped helped advance fully, and and it's it's still an issue to th- to this day. You know it it really is. I mean, and in the U.S., I mean it's not as big now, but you know you go back fifty years, a hundred years in the U.S. I mean New York, Boston, you know Philly, like this was a big issue, you know, and it still is now, and you know it just it's 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 just a real shame, quite frankly, and and. You know, there were rebellions by Southern Italians and Sicilians to um, go against the the, the Savoys as, as they came in, and there was just a, an absolutely brutal campaign to suppress them, which re- never really made it out. Um, you know, matter of fact, the first concentration camps in history were used in Southern Italy and on Sicily by the Savoys to suppress the Southern Italians' rebellions. You know, against them. And, I mean, more people died as a result in these concentration camps than in all the wars of independence in Italy combined. So that should really kind of, you know, give, you know, give a new perspective on, you know, this whole this whole mainstream story that, you know, Southern Italy was always just poor and this was a huge liberation, you know. I mean, yeah, nothing was ever perfect there. They always wanted their own sovereign state, you know, their independence that they just never got. But... You know, thing, things never really got that better. And at the end of the day, through all that, you know, the first king of Italy, Victor Emmanuel II of the House of Savoy. So, again, that is is quite quite a cl- – it just paints quite a clear picture, quite frankly. Um, you know, it, it, it becomes – you know, the, the rise of the House of Savoy, more or less. You know, okay, more or less. And it's <sighs> – you know, and so most Sicilians viewed unification with the Kingdom of Italy as acceptance of the House of Savoy. You know, because the house is, you know, from which Victor Emmanuel II came. And, you know, really that's more or less what was happening, you know. And and, and honestly, under the House of Savoy as United Italy, Sicily was just back to square one. I mean, back to poor conditions, a ruling class, um, you know... It, the mafiosi they they just grew and then not only from garibaldi they beca- they started to be um pretty much henchmen of landowners there so if you weren't lucky enough to own your own plot of land you were being extorted and paying ridiculous rents if you're a peasant farmer to your landowner who is being you know actually you you know you're you're being victimized by the mafiosi who are you know, under the employee of your landowner. And this leads to absolutely mass migration of Southern Italians and Sicilians. I mean, you know, like half a million Sicilians to Austria and the Americas alone, not to mention the former Kingdom of Naples, you know, people from there. And, you know, it, it's just absolutely phenomenal, you know, how, how bad things got after after the Kingdom of Two Sicilies fell, quite frankly. So, you know... Just to review, you had, I mean, it's just absolutely crazy. I mean, I'm trying to gather my thoughts for a moment, you know, how, how 
how absolutely badly things spiraled out of control here. I mean, you had so the guy who's supposedly liberating you is hiring organized crime which sticks around and just gets worse and worse and worse because now they have power, now they have influence, now they have money to do their own things. Um, Taxes are immediately raised, right? Rents are immediately raised. Corruption grows above the top classes, and there's such maltreatment by the feudal lords to the lower classes that groups are attacking nobility and destroying their property, and then... You know, and, and really that that's the basis of the Mafia, if we're really getting down to it. If you go years back, that was the beginning of the Mafia was, you know, from this. Which can be attributed not just to the Savoys, but in general. I mean, you know, it, it just grew and grew and grew. And, and when you're being employed by, a, you know, an incoming government, I mean, that just, that's just no good, quite frankly. You know, so... The kingdom fell in four months, Naples, after he landed on, on after Garibaldi landed at, at Naples four months later. That's just it. You know, it's done. Um, you know, and, and so back to the theory. I mean, apparently Garibaldi was, okay, so the Savoys were bankrupt, and British investors kind of stepped in. As I discussed earlier, the sulfur mines, that's a big part of this theory, right, is that, I mean, because Ga Garibaldi was very obviously hired by the Savoys, but the Savoys... The kingdom of Savoy was was really quite in debt. So the theory being that the British investors stepped in, kind of loaned them the money, and they were kind of made, you know, backhand deals, whatever, for the various resources. Okay, so you know, as as you look now, the GDP per person in the Italian regions is as low as it gets in the boot of Italy, being the former kingdom of Naples. And Sicily, the island of Sicily. And the northern states have got the highest GDP per person in Italy. Okay? And so, you know, if, 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 we look, if we're looking back, right, and we're kind of just reviewing things, I mean, highest per capita university students was the kingdom of the two Sicilies out of the entire region. First pension system in Italy was in the Kingdom of Two Sicilies. They had the lowest taxes. They had the largest iron and steel manufacturing plant. They had the largest iron casting foundry. They had the first glass recycling program. They had the first gas-fueled streetlight system. They had the first railroad in Italy. And they were ranked the third country in the world for industrial development at that time at a... There was some industrial fair, I believe they had, or summit at the time. Ranked third country in the world for industrial development. Okay? Highest per capita number of phys physicians, excuse me, physicians in southern Italy and, and Sicily. They had the lowest infant mortality rate. And I mean, it's, it's just absolutely crazy. And most Sicilians of 18th century owned their homes and at least a garden of or a small plot of land. So, you know, it it wasn't just like some backwards place where they were just living in huts and just, you know, never tasted meat before. That's just not the way it was. Okay. And, you know, and, and now their rebellions in 1820 and 1840 weren't economic. These were not economic rebellions and revolts. These were political, and these were centered around the liberal demands for a government separate from, you know, whatever they had. And more or less, this was a direct result as the appeal of the Bourbons that did away with the constitutions they had. That's what this was, okay? And bottom line, that's just, that's just you know, the Bourbons caused their own downfall, quite frankly. Um, you know, the Normans had, had, had enacted very nice uh, systems, political systems and constitutions and what have you, and then when Ferdinand I, during the, during the Napoleon era, when Ferdinand I was still the king... Um, Lord John Bentinck helped formulate this two-house parliament on Sicily. Fantastic, uh, you know, constitution. And soon, as soon as Congress of Vienna turns it back over to the Bourbons, they do away with all that. And, I mean, it's just revolt after revolt. And, and that's just where things, you know, just... And, and from then on, you knew it was never going to last. Um... You know, I'm just going over my notes here. Excuse me. See if there's anything else I need to say. I mean, I think I've pretty much covered most of most of everything that there was to cover. Yeah, I mean, 
you know, the two Sicilies at that time, they held 60% of all Italian wealth, um, gold and silver backed coins, not no paper money at all, actually, I don't believe. Um, the amount of coinage in circulation at the time was double that of all the other states combined. So it's easy to point at these stats that I'm spitting out and I'm saying, and you know, you look at it and you say, oh, well, it's it's the biggest... You know, you look at the map. You're like, oh, well, that's a huge region of 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 peninsular Italy and and it, it, the Italian states as a whole. It's oh, it's so highly, you know, highly populous. Of course, they have more money. There's more people. That doesn't mean it, it's distributed equally or anything like that. The amount of coinage in circulation, this gold and silver coinage, doubled that of all the other states combined. Okay. Um, I mean, and the public debt was so much lower than the other states. I think the public debt was like half that of Piedmont, like per capita. OK, and Lombardy and nowadays, I mean, these are the places that are just so wealthy. It's ridiculous. I mean, lower taxes than any other states. I mean, you can go on and on and on with these things. But all we see nowadays is it was full of corruption and poverty. And they all supported the unification of Italy because it was, you know, helping them out. And, you know, you know, you hear all these things. And, and quite frankly, that just, you know, that just wasn't the case. I mean. It just wasn't. And in the end, the House of Savoy became exiled in 1946 when Italy became a republic. So, you know. How about that? Um, and, you know, after after unification, I've already covered, you know, how things just went terribly for the locals and they all ended up leaving. But, I mean, the gold reserves became depleted and embezzled. All the big factories, as I talked about, they had the largest iron foundry. They had the largest, you know, these different manufacturing plants. They were all moved to the north, which caused mass job loss and poverty, which led to the mass migration in the south of Italy to the U.S. and Australia and various other other lands, you know, South America also. And, yeah, so that's, that's, that's pretty much it. Again, I, I've been wanting to make a video about this for a long time. I visited Sicily. Um, I've got photos of me. There's a couple here that I have. Um, Catania, Catania, Tormina with uh, Mount Etna in the background on the far right of, of the screen there. You know, this was years ago before the beard, quite obviously. And, and it, so I encourage anybody to go to the south of Italy, um, you know, and, and you still see it. I mean, you go down there and you see that it's it's, it's kind of dumpy, you know, a lot of places, man. I mean, a lot of things are run down. I didn't go to Naples but my brother, who I'd went to visit here because he lived there for six years in, in Catania, on the outskirts of Catania near near uh, Tormina, he had went to Naples and he said it was just, I mean, terrible. I mean, it's still heavily crime ridden. And, and all of these factors now of, of the south of Italy and Sicily being the way they are, lowest GDP, high poverty, high crime, these all stem directly from the kingdom of the two Sicilies being broken down. Um, you know, I don't know how to say it any clearer. I mean... That that's that's more or less what happened. So, in hi hindsight's twenty twenty, you know, and as a as a you know a history buff, you always kind of look at these things, and 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 to me, the main factor is that you know the the Bourbons and any of the ruling powers at the time, honestly, if they could have simply let these Sicilians get their own constitution and their own rule, but there was a middle ground there, I guess. You know, I, it's tough to say give them their own rule because then that means they want you out. But they always were really just anti-French, but they seemed to really be okay with the Spanish, you know, the Spanish ruling ruling class there. You know, the ruling power there. You know, the Spanish Bourbons. And if 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 Fer Ferdinand really really dropped the ball there, if if they could have kept that constitution that was instilled with the help of the British during the N N Napoleonic Wars. I feel like this would be a different, you know, a different outcome. So hopefully the south of Italy and, 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 and um, you know, Sicily really makes a comeback in their future. I hope it for the people and the land. But, again, I visited there. It's absolutely wonderful. It's marvelous. It's beautiful. Everyone should go. So if you're looking at an Italian uh, holiday for travel, I would look to the south because it absolutely is worth it. But with that being said, that's, that's it for the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, you know, it's a subject that I'm, I'm, I'm really quite, quite passionate about is just, uh, 
you know, the history of, of, of the world, really. Um, you know, I really enjoy the political and economic aspect of it and seeing how things trade hands and what what comes from it. So, you know, a lot of food for thought here. I hope you enjoyed it, whether you're just watching it, having a coffee in the morning, or maybe you just got it on in the background while you're doing dishes, because I, I do that a lot often. And, you know, if, if there's any any anything you'd like to add about about the presentation, please leave a comment below. Any ideas for a future video you'd like to see me present and, and kind of dive deep into and, and just put, put the facts out there, please leave it below. Otherwise, thanks a lot for watching.